In our first encounter with the intrepid adventurers of the Paranormal Investigation Force, we travelled into the very depths of Russian Siberia, on the trail of the mysterious Baba Yaga, and we were left in the end with a bit of a cliffhanger. What would become of them? Would they find this mysterious creature? Well, my dear friends, I'm delighted to bring you part two of this story. You've been yearning for it, and now it's finally here. So, I think you'll deserve to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. <laughs> my apologies for the long break. I didn't expect my post to garner the attention that it has. In fact, it's gotten so much attention that I'm a little worried. If the boss finds out someone is posting stories again, he'll be less than happy. Although I do have an idea about how to deal with that. <laughs> Anyways, last assignment turned out to be nothing more than an old couple experiencing hallucinations as a result of an as-of-yet undiscovered plant species, releasing, well, a hallucinogenic spore of some kind. Although it's rare, sometimes these things can be explained by science, with many incidents throughout history being wrongfully attributed to supernatural forces, when in fact it was just something we didn't understand. Even now, I wonder if what we do will be looked upon in the future as, well, nothing but the pseudoscientific eradication of things we don't yet fully grasp. But back to the story at hand. I understand leaving you at such a spot as that was impolite of me, so I'll make it up to you by telling you what happened, starting with the very next day. With the wind still whipping at my covered face, doing its best to blast and sting any exposed part of my skin with snowflakes, I drew ever closer to the small, unassuming cabin in the woods. It was difficult to imagine that such an innocent building could be part of such an horrendous train of death and destruction. It looked like it had been built in the colonial period, with mud chinking between the logs that made up its walls and frame, as well as a roof made of thatch and various other materials, looking like it was falling apart. As I walked, I marked trees with my knife, making sure that I could find my way back to camp when I was finished here. I may be good at what I do, but I do get disoriented quickly, and getting lost in there meant death. Finally, I reached the front porch. It was strangely normal, containing only a simple rocking chair with no cushion, and a four-legged stool that looked like it had been made for a child. I hesitated for a moment before stepping onto the wooden flooring, which creaked like an old wooden galleon as soon as I set my foot on the step. I also noticed, to my amazement, that the wind had died down once I'd entered the small area around the cabin. It hadn't stopped, but it was no longer biting at every inch of me, trying to freeze anything it could with its frosty maw. As I peered into the opaque windows, which were filled with an amber light, lightly from a gas lamp, a whispery voice filled the air, seeming to float out of the cabin with a breeze saying with every syllable drawn out to the maximum understandable length, Enter. The door creaked the same as the stairs to the porch did, cracking itself open, with no apparent motivation for doing so. Although it was not uncommon to see telekinesis in my line of work, it didn't make it any less unnerving. There's something distinctly anomalous about seeing objects move with no apparent force acting on them that causes their motion. I walked up to the door, using my gloved hand to push it open. It took almost no effort. I saw inside the cabin a strange but welcome sight. It had been upgraded with modern amenities, including a toilet and shower that looked as if they were torn from an old motorhome and several pieces of old Soviet furniture. She sat in a red cushioned chair near the fire, her frail hands resting on the arms of the chair. She almost looked like she was dead, her skin colourless and almost a bluish-grey colour. But I saw her stir as soon as I moved one step closer. She looked a lot less evil as she sat there, her body moving slightly as she pushed her arms into the air, 
yawning and smacking her gums, which held very few teeth. She spoke, but not directly into my mind like before. She used her body, which, despite looking empty and emaciated, produced perfect phonetic sounds, in English nonetheless. You, the one which does not carry the stench of a filthy Russian, will find my child. It was not a request. In the most respectful and professional voice I could muster, I stated, Well, ma'am, if you don't mind me saying so, it's going to be quite impossible without more information. She replied slowly, after giving a slightly irritated sigh. Very well, Desert Man. You and your barren words, your information, you shall know his name. Casimir. My child was born with no formal name, or rather, he was never given one. I sat on this information for a second, trying to understand what she meant with all of her old-timey language. She referred to him as my child. But it was evident then and now that this was most likely impossible, for this frail but magical old lady could have no childbirthing powers. A few intrusive thoughts crossed my mind about the subject, but I won't repeat them here so as to preserve your sanity. A few moments later, I decided to ask her about it. Hopefully she wouldn't destroy me as she had everyone else that had crossed the path of her chicken-legged house until then. In particular, I was afraid because of what I'd seen of the MCHS team she'd encountered earlier. My mood was calm and collected, but internally I was anything but. I'd worked with some MCHS Spetsnaz guys before, in some heavily classified Chernobyl-related stuff, and they were no idiots. Analyzing that image again, which seemed to be planted in my mind quite vividly, their formation suggested that they'd been making their way through the forest on foot, and had been hit with no time to react. No time to even run. Just crushed. I got the feeling that if I didn't find this Casimir soon, my team, as well as many other innocent civilians, would meet the same fate. I finally asked, So, Miss... what is your name? She responded in a dull, almost bored voice, but starting to show more signs of annoyance. Yaga. It should have been obvious, but she was already a little irritated, so I wasn't going to take any chances. I tactfully restarted my previous sentence. Uh, Miss Yaga, what is your relationship to Mr. Casimir? She replied, mimicking with her face the equivalent of an eye roll although her eyes were closed, so it was impossible to tell if they'd actually moved. As she spoke, a roller coaster of tone and pitch moved with her words, voice softening when she spoke of Casimir, and peaking when anything Russian was mentioned. It should be obvious, desert man, but if I must explain in your terms, he was an adopted child. I took pity on him laying there in a ditch so many winters ago, being abandoned in the mud of the melting winter frost, which, I might add, your technology is responsible for. I raised him, clothed him, fed him for many years, until he decided to leave, determined to explore the outside world. I warned him against it, but he was my child. I could not stop him. I looked down for a moment, unsure if I could understand how she, of all people, the apparent mass murderer of hundreds of innocent villagers, could take pity. But I resolved myself, repeating in my mind, Not my job. It's not my job. I had almost all the information I needed, and, my earlier theory being proved correct, I decided to ask one final question. The only thing I needed to know. Why did they take him? She responded after a pause, a sneer growing on her face. I did not know that he was one of their own until they took him. They made him, 
So they think they own him. He is mine. I was unnerved at the notion that the Russians had somehow made this kid. Images of test-tube children popped into mind. But she spoke again before I could ask for clarification. You must be on your way now, desert man. My house begins to reek of sand, and your friends are getting anxious. I give you three days to find him, and I will resume looking. Meet me at your little fort by the river in three days' time. I kindly obliged her, because, given the environment, it didn't seem like I had much choice in the matter. The information I had would have to do, and hopefully the MCHS would know more about this kid. As I moved onto the porch, she spoke again, striking fear into me with these words, floating out into the cabin as a light breeze among the still fierce winds, audible but difficult to understand. Oh, an Americansky. Beware of the animals of the forest, for although I am everywhere, I am not the only danger lurking among these beautiful frozen trees. I stepped off of the porch, turning around to face her voice and thank her. But the house was gone. Just gone. I stood there for a moment, staring at the depression in the snow where a house had formerly been, and after a pause, sighed. Although disappearing houses really aren't normal, this was not my first rodeo. It is my job, after all. I found my path from before, using the gashes I'd left periodically in trees to retrace my route, finally arriving at our makeshift camp. Gabe sat, rifle raised at me, looking quite pissed off through his snow gear. I'll be back. It's important, really. You disappear for the better part of an hour, and you just leave me a goddamn note. I started to reply, to calm him down, but then I remembered the final words of wisdom Baba Yaga had passed on to me. Beware, I am not the only danger lurking among these beautiful frozen trees. I looked up to scan my surroundings, and of course, right there, 25 meters behind Gabe, there was a deer. Now, typically when you think of a deer, you think of a docile animal only really violent for the natural purposes of mating. In fact, for many it may be difficult to imagine a deer as a violent, threatening thing, but I assure you, it was threatening to see a deer with completely dark skin, two straight antlers the length and sharpness of a cavalry sword, and glowing red eyes, staring you down from just under stone-throwing distance away. Gabe yammered away at me, but it went in one side and out the other of my head. I stared the deer down, its eyes meeting mine with a sort of morbid curiosity, the way you look at dead things. It snorted, taking a step towards me, and you may be able to guess, but I don't believe in God, mostly because of all the godless things I have seen in my line of work. But if I did, I would have sent him a prayer right about the time six more pairs of eyes emerged out of the fog like snow churning about in the heavy but abating winds. I finally snapped out of the stair, as all seven of them took another step towards us. I raised my rifle, and at this Gabe shut up, turning around to face the threat. I darted to my left, bracing myself against the branch of a leafless dying tree. Gabe saw the approaching figures, and began to curse the fact with an oh f but was interrupted by the blast of a 7.62mm round, leaving the long barrel of my Dragunov, reaching out to touch the creatures that now approached us. The moment seemed to slow down, not quite slow motion, but slow enough to notice. Ice flooded into my veins, and my body felt like it was no longer an object of thought, but an extension of my mind. I could feel my breath leaving my chest as I watched the round's impact on the lead target. A mid-body hit, with some effectiveness. I squeezed off another round. They were running now, their dark bodies contorted into a raging mass of muscle and bone, 
their hooves kicking up puffs of snow, accelerating them towards us. Time slowed even more now, and I could almost see the individual snowflakes flying past my scope as my second round impacted directly on the head of the beast. It stopped, wavering for a moment, before stumbling and falling onto the ground, incapacitated. As this happened, time began to speed back up. This made me aware of two facts. One, that Gabe was kneeling on the ground next to me, firing his AN-94 with its special two-round bursts, emitting two rounds nearly simultaneously. And two, that Dimmy had also woken up. And although he was not exactly in fighting condition, his rifle was also firing, full auto. Maybe a little less effective, but at least it was led downrange. They were nearly upon us. My instinct said to get behind cover, but the trees were several meters away, too far to run, and I would be leaving Dimmy and Gabe to be gored. Their heads lowered, and showed us the two antlers on their heads that would likely kill us if they ever made it to us. It hit me just then, not the deer, but the fact that if they hit me, I would be frozen out there, with nobody to remember me and no legacy left behind. After all, it's a legacy we all want, isn't it? I knew I had to act fast if I wanted to survive. What did I have, though? A smile broke my cold, silent face as I thought. Ah, I know what to do here. I threw my rifle into a snowbank and dove for the gear bags, tearing out a small, unassuming cylinder with a ridge running along the top, starting around a third of the way down its sixty-centimeter body. They were close now, ten meters away. I pulled the back of the tube out, extending its length to a little more than a meter. Doing this caused the covers on the front and back to flip up and open, and the rectangular sight posts on the ridge to emerge. I took a knee and grabbed the rear sight post, twisted it 90 degrees, then set my fingers on the button in front of it as I shouldered the RPG-18. I took a deep breath, set the sight post dead onto the lead animal, and shouted, Clear! Backblast! before touching off the rocket, depressing the small black button on the top. A click, then a deafening boom. The area behind me exploded in a burst of high pressure, throwing snow into the air and knocking chunks of ice off the trees. A rocket leapt out of the tube, its shape charge heat warhead impacting on the lead deer perfectly, digging into its flesh before hitting something solid, causing the deer to explode into a cloud of red-orange high-explosive fireball. But, as the rocket's explosive power was fully dispersed, a new source of heat and energy blasted the six remaining creatures, exploding outwards from the destroyed area around the now-gone deer. Blue-green flames engulfed all of them, burning and charring their flesh instantly, causing them to fall in their tracks. It was like they were flash-cooked in a propane bath, because once every flame had dissipated, the now five-strong force stood for moments before practically disintegrating into the winds which rushed to fill the cavernous hole left in the forest, of superheated air that leapt into the sky. And then, just as it had begun, it was all over. Thankfully, the explosion was not powerful enough, even only a few meters away, to hurt us, but it certainly was close. Close enough that, had we not been wearing hearing protection, we surely would have lost it for quite a while. Gabe laid prone out in front of me, silent. I let the smoking fiberglass and aluminum launch tube lower to point at the ground in front of me, and then sat there for a moment, admiring the quality of the work I'd just done. Gabe spoke, rolling over onto his back to face me. You know, if it wasn't for all of the winter gear, that would have singed my eyebrows off. I stood up, ignoring his comment and tossing the used-up tube to the side, before walking over and reclaiming my dragon off from the snow. Although melted snow had wet the barrel and moldenized polymer furniture of the SVD, 
Mere water was not an issue for the formidably reliable Russian DMR. It was still practically pitch black out, with the clouds absorbing what light the moon itself reflected from the sun. The light from the explosion had ruined our night vision, and I was not keen to stick around to see, or not see, the things that would come to investigate now, and to boot. We were all out of ordnance, so if we ran into a group like that again, oh God forbid, another one of those damnable bears, we would be S.O.L. I told Dimmy and Gabe to pack up their things, that we needed to get going and get gone. They both agreed, and hastily replaced all of their packed things, minus the MRE wrappers and whatever was frozen into our shelters. At that point, we really didn't care, so long as we were able to make it out alive. I think at this point, it's worth mentioning that, yes, my life had been endangered at other points in my line of work. Almost every day, in fact. And yes, the pay isn't even that good for what it is. I mean, it sure pays a lot better than the military did, or any other armed service for that matter. But I've seen many people fall into madness from the things they'd seen. But one thing you'll understand if you're ever in a similar position, military or otherwise, is that you never really get used to having your life in danger. Sure, after experience it can be reduced to a minor thought in the mind, but it will never leave you completely. That is, if you are a psychopath, you'll always be nagging there, raising the possibility, am I going to die here? In my view, there are three ways to respond to death. The most common is to ignore it, to keep pushing on, to keep going despite the danger. A less prevalent, although still common, perspective is one of cowardice. You shrivel up into a ball. You may still be able to perform your duties, but you'll shuffle about like a zombie, hoping you won't die. The third, and most rare respond to the threat of death, is to embrace it. To welcome death into your mind is not something done easily, nor something done with wanton abandon. You must welcome death into every fibre of your being, until you know only one thing when it's around. That thing being, you will live, and your opponent will die. And that is my method of dealing with death. Gabe fits the first stereotype. He tries to forget what he's fighting for, who he's fighting for, and just focus on the moment. Demi, well, I'm not really sure yet, even to this day. I'd love to ask him, only, oh, I suppose now is a good time as any. After we packed up our stuff, and were about to figure out which way to go, we'd noticed he was gone. He'd left our little camp, and a trail of footprints showed he'd moved over to where the deer had come from. Gabe and I noticed this simultaneously, and we thought he'd done the same thing as last time, gone off on his own to relieve himself. When we heard him scream moments later, our suspicions were confirmed, except this time he was not running away or shouting our names. That was the guttural war cry of a dying man. Then, along with his screaming, as our booted feet scrunched through the snow in unison towards him, we heard a flurry of gunshots. 545 by 39 rattling off in the slow, controlled fire rate of the AN-94. We came around a group of trees to find him pinned to a tree by the one remaining deer, its body lifeless against him. His chest had been pierced, two antlers stuck where his lungs should have been. If the wind wasn't cold enough to freeze the blood around the holes, making a seal possible, he would not have been able to scream with such ferocity. We rushed over to him, soaked in his own blood, and a strange greyish-red ooze that appears to have come from the deer. Where this was present, it was eating away at whatever it happened to be on, in this case, Dimmy's uniform, and in some places, his skin. He didn't seem to care, though. He panted in short, shallow breaths, the condensation in his breath puffing out of his balaclava every so often. He feebly reached up to his goggles, trying to pull them off, but failing in his attempt. 
His other hand could no longer hold his rifle, which had fallen to the ground, magazine empty. He reached to remove his goggles, pulling them off of his face, along with his balaclava. He told me he didn't have very long. I looked at Gabe, and the slight side-to-side -side shake of his head told me that he shared my sentiment. Dimmy began to speak, and it was clear by the dejection in his voice he knew what was going to happen. In my breast pocket there is a letter. I had a wife once. He stopped to cough up blood, feebly dripping from his mouth and freezing on his chest. Snowflakes blew and caught on his facial hair, which had grown scruffy in the time we'd been out in the forest. He blinked his eyes, and hacked once more before finishing his sentence. Please, take it to her. Tell her I am sorry. Tell my son. Hacking once more, he continued, finishing his sentence. Tell him I am sorry. And after this, he closed his eyes and it seemed as if he was finally at peace. When Gabe moved to open his breast pockets, I spoke to Dimmy, hoping he could still hear me, my voice filling with rage as I reached the end of my statement. Don't worry, buddy. We'll find your wife. We'll find your son. And by all that is holy, I will avenge you. I saw him mumble, his lips barely moving, and the only audible sound the wisps of air escaping from his freezing lips. We sat there, accompanying him for a good while, until he no longer drew breath. I couldn't pinpoint the exact moment it happened, even if I had video footage. Oh, there's another trope in films and movies that doesn't hold up in real life. Sometimes, yes, but rarely do people maintain consciousness until the end, until they suddenly just die. After he was gone, for sure we sat in silence for a moment. I checked my watch, then turned to Gabe. It's almost 0600. We need to move. He turned to me, anger in his voice. We can't just leave him here. I replied, my typically cold, hard voice cracking under the pressure of Dimi's passing, anger seeping in from the hours of sleep deprivation. There's nothing we can do for him. And damn it, if we don't leave now, there's a good chance we'll end up just like him. Pinned to a tree and out of luck. Gabe huffed and spat at me. We don't leave anyone behind. Dead or living. And I don't make exceptions. I responded, using the only thing I knew for sure would get through to him. Although, only as a last resort. I questioned him, hoping to strike his heartstrings with... What would she say? This instantly changed his demeanour. He began to rise up in rage at the fact that I would dare mention his family on a mission such as this. But as soon as his chest began to puff up and his fists clenched in anger, he deflated. His head tilted down and he took one look at Dimmy's frozen corpse before saying, in a defeated and hushed tone, The least we can do for him is to cover his face, before spinning on his heel and turning away, letting me do the deed. I pulled Dimmy's balaclava back up, set his goggles squarely on his closed eyes, then draped his scarf over his head to cover him, tucking it in to ensure it would stay that way, not that anything was going to be at him any time soon. I then said to him one final line, a parting message. You were... You were a crappy soldier, Dimmy, but an excellent guide. I turned away and walked quickly back to my pack, which lay on the ground mostly in order. Gabe sat next to it, still seeming to be in a bad mood from our earlier conversation, and probably Dimmy's death. Our little camp lay strewn about, everything pretty much in the same place it had been when I left into the night. The wind had decided to take a bit of a break for once, giving us a much-needed reprieve from the wind chill, although the ambient temperature was still well below freezing, and the snow still fell on us, but much more gentle than the razor blades flying around in the air earlier. 
I stood in front of Gabe now, with his gaze remaining at my feet. Hey, we may have our disagreements, and I would certainly have chosen someone else coming all the way out here, but you've done a great job for the situation we threw you into. He sat there, incredulously, as if he was deaf. I continued after the pause to see if he would react. But regardless of the problems we face, we are here now, and we have to work together to make it out alive. I considered mentioning his family again, but did not in consideration of the fact that we were already on thin ice. Instead, I offered my hand to him, and at this he looked up, leering at me through his goggles. He held their gaze for a moment, before forcefully grabbing my hand and pulling himself and the weight of his pack up to eye level. He grabbed me by my parka, leaning in. Pulling down his balaclava, he spoke through clenched teeth in a low, angered growl, blowing his hot, foul MRE breath all over my thankfully covered face. She doesn't even know I'm out of here, so for your information, she wouldn't think anything of it. He paused for a second, likely to let that statement sink in, although it only made me more anxious to get moving. He pushed off of me towards his pack, leaving me a little puzzled as to what his problems back home entailed. I stood there for a moment before leaning down to my pack to examine what I'd left. After several gear cuts, we had only what we could carry with us, which wasn't much. A Geiger counter, a spectrometer, about 70 rounds of rifle ammo, a four-inch tall grey pixie, the radio, some rations. I'd pulled everything out of my pack and set it on the ground. Then, and only then, did I notice the fact that I had a dead pixie in my backpack. I stared at it blankly for a few moments before shrugging and saying to myself, Not like it's my fault base can't control the pixie infestation. Then, as I was putting everything back in and repacking it, I heard something oddly out of place in the quiet forest. An extremely high-pitched noise. Something that sounded oddly like... Well, I thought to myself, no, it couldn't be. Just then, the radio crackled to life for the first time in twelve hours. A relief for myself and everyone involved, I'm sure. I snatched the brick-like receiver out of the snow as a Russian called over the airwaves in garbled English. Copperhead. Colonel Razinyai. I yanked the antenna out so fast I nearly broke it, and with Gabe coming over to investigate, I responded, trying to get the message out that we were all at least still alive. Colonel Razinyai. Copperhead actual reads. Do you copy? The radio went silent slight hint of static coming over for a moment. Just as I opened my mouth to repeat my message, the voice came over the radio again, this time much clearer, but still with terrible clarity. Copperhead actual. We copy. We've been looking for you since 1800 hours yesterday. I pondered this for a moment, before asking a question to the pilot, whose engines I could hear circling in the clouds above us. I suppose none of this has anything to do with the animals we've been encountering out here. The response I received after a good long wait confirmed my suspicion. I am running low on fuel, Copperhead. Do you have a message for the General? I almost smiled, but was stopped by a sudden resurgence of the present and past. I spoke solemnly, responding to the Colonel. Tell him we're one man down. And if they have a teenager named Casimir, to get him to us as fast as they can. Then the radio fell silent, and after a few minutes the sounds of engines faded from the sky. I sighed, and then looked at Gabe. He just nodded, saying, Yeah, I definitely know. And considering the circumstances, I think they knew that something was going on long before we went in. All of that perimeter security wasn't for the old lady. I nodded in agreement, packing up the rest of my stuff. Gabe was still staring at me blankly, until he suddenly looked down at his pockets, 
apparently having an epiphany, seeing something I had not noticed in my exhausted state. He thirstily jabbed his hand into his pocket, yanking out a small device the size of a smartphone. As I watched, I came to the realization. If the radio worked, then so would everything else, including the snowmobiles. The device Gabe had just produced was a GPS, and, thankfully, it had signal, even if it was weak. This signal provided some interesting and surprising information. The Gabe relayed to me what the gaps were telling him. Based off the telemetry, it's we're about 40 kilometers from the village. Thought we were a hell of a lot farther than that, but to hell with it. Thought we were a hell of a lot farther than that, but to hell with it, I responded. Internal excitement not betrayed by my dead, cold voice. Get to the Vix. Get them working, then bug the hell out to Ashtown. Gabe looked at me for a moment, seemingly processing my words, before finally nodding in agreement. Thankfully, the break in the wind was holding for now, but the snow continued to fall. We threw our packs upon our backs and then started to march. The march of a modern military is not the goose-stepping parade march you see North Korean conscripts doing, but something along the lines of a 5k pace, typically humping 80 pounds of gear along with you. Not a feat easily accomplished by a normal, untrained individual. However, Gabe had a military background, and I had the equivalent in the private sector. This made the intensive 15-minute, 3-kilometer march back to the snowmobiles easy enough. When we got there, we stopped and changed our socks, then began to check the snowmobiles. Gabe checked the larger one, telling me after he unscrewed the cap of the gas tank, Chances are these are going to be frozen solid, but considering where we are, I'm hoping the locals have fitted them with some winterization. He got the gas tank open on his, just as the cap came off of mine. He reported, This one's still half full. What about yours? I replied, Looking at the scene before me, well, it should be full, but there isn't shit in here. I shook the vehicle just to make sure I wasn't hallucinating, but sure enough, the gas tank was completely empty. This was very concerning, but considering that at every turn this mission had gotten worse and worse, I wasn't surprised in the slightest. I looked at the snow underneath the machine, and it looked sort of yellow but not like yellow snow yellow, more like it was sprinkled with highly diluted food colouring. I picked up a handful, bringing it up to my face. It reeked of gasoline. I disappointedly turned my o Ugh! I disappointedly turned over my hand, letting the fuel snow slurry fall from my hand before wiping my glove on the seat of the now useless vehicle, letting out a sigh as I did so. <sighs> I guess it all leaked out. We're down to one vehicle. Gabe was much more optimistic. That's shit. But it looks like we're in luck with this one. He looked at me as he depressed a button on the handle of the snowmobile. And the engine began to turn over. An electric starter pried the engine from its frozen coma. And as the electricity turned the multiple cylinder mass of metal, I heard something. Not the engine... Oh, of course it was making a noise. But something above us. The cry of a hawk. Gabe and I looked up into the sky, despite the darkness, searching as we drew our weapons, preparing to fight. We both knelt down by our respective vicks, taking cover from what we thought to be a danger. Gabe called out to me frantically. Get your ass over here. We've got to move. At this, I snatched my pack from where it lay next to the front skis, throwing it onto my back as I vaulted over the snowmobile. Gabe and I were not necessarily friends, but I knew that urgency in his voice was genuine. Little did I know, as we were both taking cover, he'd put on his spectrum set. Apparently, this made his perception of the environment around him scary, to say the least. I slid into position next to him from a dead sprint. He was hastily securing his pack to the trailer. I slid mine off of my back, and he took it from me without breaking pace, rolling it onto the top 
and tying it down with paracord. He then grabbed for my rifle, which I was not thrilled about, but there was a reason he was working in silence, and as much as I was unhappy to have my rifle secured to the side of the snowmobile and not in my hands, I didn't object. There was a reason he was doing all of this, and as soon as I had a moment to take in the situation, I realized that he was wearing the spectrum, and it came to me then. He was seeing something that I wasn't, likely whatever was up there in the clouds. Before everything was finally secured, Gabe handed me his AN-94, pointing to his chest, where his Parker's pockets were filled with banana mags. We mounted up, and although I would have loved to have had a pair of goggles, we had no time, at least Gabe didn't think so. We mounted up, and as soon as we were both on, he gunned it. The snowmobile threw snow out into the night behind us, rocketing along with the engine screaming into the night, reaching high rooms as it pushed to its max. I don't think at any point he let go of the accelerator, not until we got within five kilometers of the village. He let the machine coast to a stop, the friction of the rear track assembly grinding to a halt. Gabe swiveled his head, checking our surroundings. He turned to me, lifting his goggles and speaking to me for the first time in roughly thirty minutes. Put on your spectrum. He didn't have to tell me twice. I hopped off, opened my tied-down but not inaccessible pack, and removed my spectrum gear, including the helmet and sensor pod, strapping it on under my parka. It would be slightly less effective this way but I wasn't about to sacrifice my ears to get a little more peripheral vision. With this done, I jumped back on the snowmobile and switched on the gear. Within moments, the night vision kicked in, extending my visibility in the now slightly lighter than an hour ago morning. It was 0700 by now, and soon it would be getting brighter. Even so, the infrared illumination kicked in, with an invisible light lancing through the darkness, digital and analog enhancement lighting up things I didn't even know were there before, all returned and overlaid through the spectrum. Inside the display, a color system is assigned to every object that stands out. It gets a lot of false positives, so it's up to the wearer to decide what is a threat and what isn't. Right now, though, I saw a whole hell of a lot of nothing, except, of course, when I looked up. There were about twenty dots in the sky, bright yellow, and as the index told me, down in the left corner, a definite threat. They moved about each other lazily, and from their movement patterns, the software identified them as birds. I looked to Gabe, who saw an IR strobe on my sensors, affirming that my goggles were on. I suddenly understood now why he'd given me his rifle. An SVD would be useless against a bunch of birds. He pointed to the sky, and I stuck my arm out to the side of his face, giving him a thumbs up. I assume he was simply too tired to speak, because after that he just gunned the engine. The ride across the frozen landscape was a refreshing departure from all of the gunfire and horror that I had lived amongst in my other assignments. You see, we're not just the premier paranormal organization of the world. We are also a highly effective PMC, or private military company. Some would call us mercenaries. In fact, I would consider myself one. But using it in polite company is not an option, since it's gained a bad connotation due to Blackwater's work in the early days of the PMC. They had several incidents where many civilians were killed, some with no provocation. This is not to say they were ineffective. In fact, they are supremely effective. I considered working for them at one point, but their lack of trigger discipline turned me away. Sorry, Mr. Prince, but I don't want the FBI or DOD on me more than they already are. Now, many of you may be wondering, after last time's story, how exactly it is that an organization like ours is allowed to exist under the noses of the US government, considering their large military base in Kandahar. Well... The answer to that is quite simple. We don't officially exist. I can't go into details here. 
And let's just say that we as an organization do not fall under the control of any government and were specifically created that way. We operate with no allegiance except to two core principles in this order. Neutralizing paranormal threats, or MPT, and profiting from paranormal problems, or PPP. Our MPT missions and Triple P missions always overlap and sometimes interfere with each other, which I'm sure you'll understand later. Specialized equipment can be quite costly on short notice. Anyways, I'm sure you're dying of boredom. Exposition is necessary, however. What would all this be if I neglected to explain my own background? Well, you'll just have to wait for that. We zipped through the trees as fast as we could manage. The snowmobile barely missing trees more than once. Branches reached out, doing their damnedest to clothesline us off of the snowmobile, but our ducking and weaving carried us through. We clawed our way through the forest, our minds clouded from exhaustion and the hearts heavy from the loss of Dimmy. And as the branches whipped at our faces, I hoped to whatever higher power the universe holds that we wouldn't be interrupted, because for the first time in nearly thirty hours I was beginning to fall asleep. And a lot of you were understandably upset when I ended off on a cliffhanger last time, and well, I guess this will be a little better. A lot less of a cliffhanger, but you'll still have to wait for the continuation of my story. Uh, it's unfortunate that it takes so long to write, but to write it correctly, with all the details, and of course, to pass the right emotion, I have to take my time. My therapist says that writing this will help me with the memories. There's a lot of it that I have to piece together from broken scenes, and the after-action reports taken by the cleanup crews. Everybody here is required to talk to a therapist at least once a month, on site and paid for, of course. The nature of the work we do is not exactly conducive to a healthy mental state, so you can guess why. Regardless, I hope you have a nice night, morning or afternoon, and for the love of God. Don't ever walk off and get yourself killed like Dimmy. So another weird, wonderful and wild ride into the depths of Russian Siberia there. Where are we? Where are we going? Sounds like there's going to be a part three, doesn't it? Well, I certainly hope so. Your thoughts and feelings on that episode in the comment section below the video, and I do so hope to be able to join you all for a little chat. But that's not it for the week. I'll be back again on Friday, and I hope you're going to join me for one more story before the weekend. Of course you will. Well, until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?